أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القاعلون ولا يحسي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتحدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وأحل بيته الطيبين الطاحرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العصر والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملنس والجان ولعن الله أعداه مجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بل الإنسان على نصه بصيرة صدق الله العلي العظيم صلاة الله محمد وعلى محمد فيس <clears throat> Our discussion for the past two nights now has been trying to bridge the gap between our ibadat and our behavior. And the premise that I had laid down to you for all of you now a couple of nights ago in my first lecture was that it seems as if in our marriages, in our families, in our masajid, in ourselves, that there's no shortage of worship being done. MashaAllah, the beards are getting thicker and the hijabs are coming on and the, and the abayas are being worn and the forehead is getting scarred, but there doesn't seem to be a change in our behavior. There seems to be regression, in fact, in our behavior. I get that just by the fact that, you know, there seems to be a higher divorce rate. Now, COVID, of course, had something to do with it. The gap between the kids and our parents is, is, is growing. Our masajid continue to have their internal politics. The ummah at large, of course, some of the major Islamic nations are in the hands of the most corrupt governments. And yet these are people that will never miss one salat. Sometimes the Hafiz al-Quran as well. And the reality was that the deen had come in Arabia and of course globally to change behavior. It wasn't just a fiqhi jurisprudence dis discussion. In fact, that worship was to actually now penetrate the heart and get into our day-to-day -day actions. And we talked about the idea that there are levels of akhlaq. If I had 10 nights with all of you, we would get through the most of the levels, but we won't. Tomorrow's my last lecture, here at least. And then I start JCC on Saturday, inshallah. Well, I'll continue this topic. Last night, we looked at the first level being, the Quran says you have to know yourself. I know that's a huge statement. It's a massive discussion of knowing yourself. But what is it that we have to know is the question. And that's what I want to focus on tonight. To get into a little bit of the idea of our behavior now changing. To first understand what is it that Islam wants from me. How can I implement that in 2022? I talked about the idea that last night, a lot of my elders who come from an Islamic nation or, or an already Islamically sound community, be it in Africa or India, Pakistan, the effort wasn't um, expected from all of you growing up to establish the deen in your part of the religion. It was already there. And you didn't know anything else. You didn't know any other lifestyle. Now you've migrated here and you've raised your kids here and you've had your kids here and now you've placed your kids in front of a buffet of lifestyles. And you're praying and you're hoping, inshallah, that they will choose the deen of Islam. We have to sell them that product, as I said. To tell them the benefits of every single dish on the, on, on the buffet, and this is the most beneficial for you. That has to be done not just through the idea of forcing salat, ensuring Quran is read, making sure the fast is there, waking them up for sehri, for example, bringing them to the mosque. A lot of it has to do with behavior. And I talked about the idea that these kids are sold on the idea that you walk the walk and you talk the talk. 
But if you claim to be a mu'min and a believer, if you claim to be an advocate of Islam, be it as a father or a mother or an alim or a principal or a student or whatever the case may be, I want to make sure that it, it, it actually penetrates inside of you first. You're not just asking me to be patient and tolerant and understanding and open-minded, but you yourself are as well. These kids don't let hypocrisy go. They will call you out, unfortunately, on the spot. That if you're asking me to pray Salat, Daddy, why aren't you praying namaz on time? Why is it me, Mama, and my siblings? Where are you at that moment? So behavior is a catalyst for change. And the Prophet of Allah killed them with kindness, as I said last night. I want to look at three verses from Surah Qiyamah and then talk a little bit about the idea of trying to be those people of distinction in our behavior. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. See, there's a whole discussion on behavior in Western psychology. The likes of Jordan Peterson and other individuals have talked about this, you know, um, with a, in a lot of detail. And behavior is very much linked to the fitrah of the insan. The way we behave sometimes is innate inside of us. A lot of us will sit there and say, look, I know I'm angry, but what do I do? Khandani <laughs> bimariye. What do I do? I'm a Jaffrey, all Jaffreys are angry. What do I do? We're tall, we're angry, we're sensitive, that's who we are. Blame, blame my genetics. Right, that's how I am. I'm outspoken, Malana. I can't remain quiet. If I, see, if, if I see something, I have to say it. What do I do? I'm khamosh mizaj. I don't really speak up. You're asking me to say something. It's not my mizaj. It's not my personality. And we sort of kind of justify our behavior, lack of or excessive, to the idea that that's just my, that's my makeup. That's how I am. And there's no doubt there's some truth to that. A, a, a thorough discussion in the ilm of akhlaq in the deen talks about the idea that a lot of our behavior comes from our genetics, absolutely. To the point where sometimes Imam Khomeini in his first hadith of Chayyal Hadith talks about the idea that a lot of what we know as our behavior sometimes we get in the womb of our mothers before we've even seen this world. But just because something is part of our innate nature or our fitra or our personality doesn't mean that we, can't, we just submit to it. That's where our jihad is. And the problem is that this society will tell our youth that, look, if you are this way, don't let anybody change you. That's who you are. Embrace yourself. Love yourself. Be yourself. You do you, bro, as they say. You do you. That's who you are. That's fine. And it's the worst advice that I've ever heard in our youth. That that's who you are. You do you. You be you. Don't, don't let anyone change you. And the dean came to change you. The deen came to say, look, if your fitrat is satanic and pharaonic in nature, change that. If your nature is someone that has to say something and you have patimu and you have, you know, sometimes the person now, you know, they say miti khanjar, right? The tongue is a miti khanjar. They slice, but they sit there and say, kya hal is al and then they slice you, right? It's very, very sweet. You have no idea you were slapped until you're like, hey, ye kya hua? You just slapped me across my face. That's their, that's their sort of mizaj. Are you just accept the fact that's how I am? No, the dean says fight that. This whole discussion on the idea of, you know, these are what my, I am moving towards this, or this is what my, I'm missing my word here. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, I'm prone to this behavior. And you shrug your shoulders and say, this is how I am. It's like a person who gets angry. We all get angry. But the person says, until I get it out, Mulana, I don't feel right. So I have to get it out. I have to say something, punch something, throw something, scream at somebody, then I feel better. And Mash, that, that's just who I am. That's just who I am. And I don't want to change myself because I'm not doing me then. And Psalm says, no, you fight yourself. You fight your tongue. If it's your mother or your father, God forbid, you walk away. You don't say a word. If that means you scream in a pillow, scream in a pillow. But don't raise your voice to your parents. If that means you have to go against who you are, then you go against who you are. That's the very essence of the jihad. So behavior is difficult. But this idea that we now are justifying our behavior to our nature, 
That has to change. We have to be able now to examine ourselves, understand yourself. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu alaykum anfusikum. Understand who you are. For you is yourself. Do some muhasaba. Do a little tafakkur and, and contemplation. Understand what are my triggers. Why am I like this? Why am I impatient? Why am I intolerant? Why does somebody come and talk to me about some political dis discussion and I get so riled up, so riled up, I don't want to see his face the next day. This intolerance comes from where? And we think it's haq. I'm on haq, I'm on haq, I'm on haq. And the Quran says, be careful. You know who you are. You know how you are. Maybe you're making excuses for yourself. And enter the three verses from, from, from Surah Qiyamah. 13, 14, 15. Beautiful verses. Surah Qiyamah, I think, is, a, is the 75th chapter of the Quran. These three verses are exactly what I want to talk about tonight. I'll tell you, to change behavior is very difficult. I'll get to the verses in a second. To change behavior is very difficult. Especially as you get older, when the cement dries, it's hard now to, you know, fix that cement. It's already been, it's been dried for 20 years now, Malana. I'm done. Right? So now to ask somebody, right? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's a horrible example here, but you know what I mean. That's the idea. And so we think we're just set in our ways. That's how I am and that's it. And the reality is, as I've said on this member several times, there is no retirement age when it comes to Islam. There has to be a constant, constant revisiting of our deficiencies, of our fallacies, of our, of, of, of our issues and our faults. I'll give you a very simple example. Not my example. This is actually Jordan Peterson's example. He's a very good example. He talks about zebras. Zebras. And the whole talk about why do zebras have stripes. Do you get Why do zebras have stripes? One person says, well, they camouflage themselves against the lions and the tigers. But the zebra's stripes are black and white. It's not a very good camouflage in the forest and the woods. You can spot a zebra in the, in, in, in the, in the jungle a mile away. The spots on a, on, a, on a leopard or cheetah make sense to me. But the black and white stripes aren't really doing their job if that's the, if, if that's the case. The truth is that they are camouflaging, but they're camouflaging it against something else. Follow the example, it's a beautiful one, not mine, of course. So I want you to imagine somebody comes to the jungle and begins to study the lives and the, and, and, and the habits and the actions of a zebra. Okay? Now, you'll be pressed to find one zebra roaming the jungle. Usually they travel in packs. Okay? And there is a whole falsafa behind that. So usually you'll see a bunch of zebras. What they're called, I don't know. Let's say a herd of zebras. Okay? So I want you to imagine that you are in charge of going to, let's say, the Serengeti in Africa, and you are to find a, a, a one zebra, and just sit there and take notes how they interact with other zebras, how they eat, how they mate, how they live, how they sleep, this and that. Fine. You come across what? 20 zebras. You're asked to pick one. Please follow my example. You're asked to pick one. So you pick one, and you watch this zebra, and you watch this zebra, and there comes a moment where you put your head down and you write down notes. And then you put your head up, and what do you do? You lost the zebra. Which one was it? You have no idea. They all look alike. You have no clue which zebra was yours. You think, oh, wait a second. I was, no, no, it wasn't that one. So you think there has to be a better way. So it is camouflaged. It's camouflaged within its own tribe. It's camouflaged within other zebras. So you think you're smart, and you probably are, so you grab a long stick, a paintbrush, you dip it in red, and from far, you color its legs red. Now you go back. MashaAllah, brother Chalak, very nice, alhamdulillah. You go and you sit there and you. Now what you've done is that you have singled out that zebra. For who? For the lion who's perched on top of the mountain. He thinks, oh, because, you know, they don't, they don't pick the suke suke zebras. They look at the, mashallah, the one that has the good gosht. And they, they attack that zebra. So they, they think, look, if the insan has marked the zebra with red, there must be some good gosht on that zebra. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to attack that red striped zebra. You thought it's easy for my, for my uh, research. You've bachata now targeted him for his lion. Now he's dead. 
a lot of us do the exact same thing in our behavior. So long as I am camouflaged in society, in my behavior, I'm fine. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be that person that wears hijab when no one else is. I don't want to be that person who walks away from a wedding that I shouldn't be at. I don't want to be that person that tells the person music is haram. I don't, I don't want to be that person that tells the person this and that. So I just want to kind of quietly do my behavior and kind of mingle and mix into the crowd. I want to be such that when they look up, they can't know where I am and where everybody else is. A lot of us are like that. I don't want to go against the grain. Examples I've given a thousand times. Imagine, if you will, as many men as there are here, we're all wearing white t-shirts. White t-shirts. And you're asked to walk in with a bright pink t-shirt on. At the door with those, with, with those windows, you can peek in and say, hey, everyone's wearing white. <laughs> I must have not gotten the dress code. I'm wearing a hot pink t-shirt right now. I walk in. I know for sure as I walk in, I make that nice long walk across the crowd, all eyes will be on me. Why? Everyone's wearing white. I'm wearing pink. I stand out. And Islam says you have to stand out, especially in a morally bankrupt society like we have today. You can't be somebody who simply now gets into the herd and now where you are, where an atheist is, where you are, where a gambler is, where you are, where an alcoholic is, who knows? There's no difference. There has to be a difference. That's the challenge. The behavior of you and I has to be, as Imam Ali describes it in Nahj al hum ahlul fawail. People of distinction. People of distinction does not mean people who are loners, who are isolated, who are in, in a corner. No. Where people now, they are distinct from everything else. So yeah, we try to kind of, you know, rock the boat a little bit. Do a little bit of this so I don't look like I'm Taliban. And a little bit of this like, like I don't look I, like I'm completely like, you know, off the path. So I try to find that middle ground where I'm the zebra, but I don't have that red strike, red paint on my legs. And in this day and age, that's not going to fly. And that's not why the deen came. The deen came for you to be an ambassador. At least start inside your home. The double standard inside of our homes is getting ridiculous. We're telling our kids about the deen. We're putting our kids in Islamic schools. We're spending money on ziyarat. And we take those same bichara, masoom kids to a wedding that you have no business being at. Or to a place, let's say, downtown, where all you see are things that you shouldn't be seeing. Or music blasting inside the home. Or every second word when you fight with your spouse is a swear word, God forbid. And then you, th and then you call someone like me and say, He's off the path, she's off the path. Can you help? Have you helped, first of all? Have you made that pro proper home environment? Have you ensured that the home now is an Islamic home? Outside is not in our control. Inside the home is in, in, in our control. We can't be like those zebras. We have to be a little bit of people who are distinct. Which means that if people are lying and cheating and stealing to make the quick dollar nowadays, we make sure our risk is halal. If we make sure, if, 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 if everybody else now is into music, Malana, everyone's doing it, Malana. This is just common now. How can it be haram if everyone is doing it? That's the point that we are missing. And that takes a very strong 16-year-old to do. A very strong 16-year-old to do. But we're fully aware of what our, our capability is and what our capacity is. What we can and what we can't do. More importantly, what we are doing and what we're not doing. Now come to the Quran. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. <laughs> Sometimes there's those uh, rosas or fasts you have where you, you, you know, the, the fast has been so easy that you have no idea what happened. Now all of a sudden, it, mashallah, it's iftar. Today wasn't one of those fasts for me. I woke up hungry, I woke up thirsty, I woke up with a headache. It happens sometimes. It's bad when you're thirsty at 9 a.m. That's, you have a whole day ahead of you then, right? So my throat's very dry right now. But hang in there with me. Surah Qiyamah talks about that moment. Verse number 13, Allah. Quran is so beautiful. Quran is so beautiful. When you read the Quran, yes, focus on your juz, no doubt. But ponder on a few verses. Read one juz, translation ten verses, act on one verse, inshallah. Our life will change. 
The Quran says that there will, co there will come a time on that day. insanu bima qaddama wa akhar. On that day, on the day of judgment. Verse 13, Surah 75. On that day, the insan, you and I, will be given news. Yunabbi'u, naba'a, khabar. We'll be given news of what? Bima qaddama wa akhar. What we left behind in, this, in that dunya and what we're going to carry forward in the next world. We'll be given that news. The next verse is mind blowing for me. The verse I read for you in the khutbah. Bala al insanu ala nafsihi basira. The reality is that this is not anything new to the insan. The insan for, for themselves is enough as a witness. Meaning what? We'll be given our kitab e amal, we'll be given our books. As you move forward, please re let, let, let's recite one loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad, please. Nice and tight. Please come up. Please come up. Thank you very much. Please come up. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful crowd, mashallah. So the Quran says, on that day we'll be given this book of Amal. But Asa Jafri, this is your book of Amal. This is what you did and what you didn't do. And this verse, Bala al-insanu ala nafsihi basira, is telling us what? That the insan knows what he did in this world. This is simply a formality. This is not late breaking news. It's not like the first time he opened up the book. No. The Quran is saying, you know exactly what's in the book. It's not like I will sit there and flip through my book. Oh, I, I, are you sure that was me? I did this? That, that was me? Really? Me? I did that? Yeah, is your name on the cover? Yeah, this is you, bro. This is your book. This is nothing new. You know exactly what you did. Don't pretend like something's going on. That's why the very next verse talks about the idea that they do what? They will do ma'adhirat. They'll do uzr. They'll do what? And that's a word that's used in Urdu, Farsi, and Arabic. They will actually offer excuses for themselves. But yeah, no, no. On, on page 45, yeah, I did that. But you know why I did that? Because she did this. They did this. That was done to me first, so I did it back to them. This is not my fault. That actually should be in their book. But the point is that we are enough as a witness for ourselves. We know exactly who we are, what we do, what we can't do. In the heart of our hearts of our hearts, we know exactly what our deficiencies are and what we are sufficient at. Some of you, mashallah, are incredible at what you do in your ibadat. Especially in the month of Ramadan. You work eight hours a day, you wake up, you guys go to school, you guys write exams, you write papers, mashallah. Don't sleep all day like I do. It's amazing what you're able to do. And then you still come in the evening, in the center, and look at this face for an hour, half an hour. It's incredible. May Allah accept that. That's very difficult to do. At the same time, the things that you need to work on and I need to work on in my behavior, we know. We absolutely know. And the Quran says you are enough for yourself. You don't need a book. The book is a formality. You've lived that life. It's like watching a movie of yourself saying, oh, really? No, you lived that movie. What are the surprises about the problem is that we, people like me, offer excuse after excuse after excuse. And we put our behavioral change into the eyes and the arms of somebody else. If they change Bolana, I'll be a saint. If they show me change, I'll stop my toxic behavior. If I'm able now to see some, a little bit of a step from, from, from them to me, I'll give them 10 steps from me to them. But they have to make the first change. And we place our entire change into their lap. And we wait, and we wait, and we wait. How many couples do I speak to? It all goes back to the idea that let him change first. Why should I change? How many times have I heard parents tell me that my kids don't respect me? They don't give jawab to my salam, for example. It's happening too much. And to give you some idea of what this, this, this verse talks about, in the tafsir of this verse, of verse number 14 specifically, they quote a discussion with Zurara, who's a heavyweight uh, a sahabi of Imam Sadiq, alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salli ala. 
talking about this fiqhi ruling that if somebody is not feeling well, oftentimes I, I, you know, we, we, we get those questions that you know, the doctor has told me that I shouldn't be fasting. And that's also you know, the, one of the miracle, miracle, miracles of the, of the month of Ramadan. When someone tells you you can't fast, that gives you more himmat to fast. It's incredible, the month of Ramadan. If someone said, oh, don't pray Fajr, okay, I won't pray Fajr, no problem. But says, don't fast, especially my young guys. I have an eight-year-old daughter, and every night she says, Baba, I'm going to bed, please wake me up for Sahri. I said, okay, so I go at 4.45. Let's go, Rahma. You ask me, and she says, if I don't wake up, remind me that, Rahma, you told me to wake you up. I said, okay. I go, Rahma, you told me to wake you up at 4.45. Baba, can I have Sadi at 8 a.m.? I go, sure, better. Have Sadi at 8 a.m., no problem. No problem. Okay, and she goes back to bed. I've tried now four times. We'll try on the weekend, inshallah. But this jazwa, this energy, I want to fast, I want to fast. It's incredible. A lot of my, a lot of my elders call us and say, look, you know, I'm, I, I have this maris, I have this sickness, blah, blah, blah. Dr. said, it's better if I don't fast. Should I listen to them or should I fast? And the answer is, you know yourself better than anybody else does. When Zurara asked Imam Sadiq, what is that criteria on whether or not I should fast when the doctor is telling me to fast, he quotes this verse as an answer. Balal insanu ala nafsihi basira. The insan knows himself better than anybody else. The insan knows himself better than anybody else. Whatever they can do to fast, they should fast. And so people do fast. People who are diabetic, people who are smokers, people who take medication, they fast. Bari Himmat say they fast. It's a tough fast, but they do. But it's interesting to note that in this conversation, a fiqhi question, Imam Sadiq uses the 14th verse of Surah Qiyamah to say, look, don't fool yourself. Don't cheat yourself. If you can do it, you should do it. The doctors say what they want, they have to say what they want. They're bound by the law and bound by their science. But if you feel that you can fast, you should fast. But it's interesting to me at least, that he quotes this verse to say that you are a witness against yourself. You have insight on your own self. I don't need to tell you what you've done or what you can or can't do. You know yourself. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And so in this discussion on behavior, two things are very important. Number one, we just can't fall back on the idea, well, that's how I am. Or the idea that nowadays everyone is doing that. And this is the problem. And in my last five minutes, let me make one point here. I'm talking a mile a minute, I'm throwing everything at you, I know. I have one more night with you and then you're free of me. But this idea here, this very, very delicate point. I mentioned last night the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam, Allahumma Salli Ala He wasn't welcome with a red carpet. There wasn't a pool kahar in Mecca, there wasn't no, nothing like that. There was garbage, there was feces, there was all sorts of a, a, accusations, a magician, thorns where he would pray. And oftentimes you would ask yourself, Rahmatillil Alameen, why would you not welcome this man um, amongst your circles? In fact, I can extend it to all of the Imams. Name me one Imam that was truly given the, 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 the chance to be the Hujjah of their time. Maybe a couple of years of Imam Ali. That's about it. Question is why? Now what? It's a, it's a mufassil bas. It's a very deep discussion. One of them is the fact that remember these Imams and the Prophet of Allah, the Ahlul Bayt in, in, in total, came to change certain social norms. The example I give often is the bearing of daughters alive. I used to for many years believe that every Meccan father did that. The moment that he got news that he was, he was having a daughter, right away to the cemetery. Not the case. A few tribes did it historically. That's it. We have mothers and aunts and sisters in Mecca. Of course we do. The few tribes did it. But the problem was this, that while the few tribes did it, the other tribes were quiet about it. Didn't say a word. It became a social norm. And that's how social norms are born. A few do it, the majority are quiet, it's just accepted and you carry forward. And the Imams and the Prophet of Allah now came to eradicate certain social norms that were going against the fabric of the deen. One of them, of course, being daughters alive. We even have in our books when our Imam will come 
as much as you and I, Jashin Manayenge, Qasideh Padenge, no doubt about that. It will be, you know, a historical event for us. We're waiting for that day. But it won't be a red carpet, especially amongst his own circles. There will be people now who will not, what, stop him and say, look, we don't want your wilayat here. Sometimes within, within his own circles. And why is that? Because they know that the imam is coming to change a, cer a certain social norm that they themselves are embedded in. Understand the point, please. We very, very easily, at least I do, very easily say, Wa'ajjil faraja. Wa'ajjil faraja. Very easily. Come quickly, come quickly, come quickly. And my fear has always been one, I don't want to be like the Ahl Kufa. I write letters to my Imam, I write letters to the Imam, come and come and come. How many times have I said Wa'ajjil Farajum? Thousands in my life. They wrote 12,000, 18,000 letters. Historically, we sit there and say, Bad Bakht Log hai. They were calling the Imam, the Imam came in and, 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 and they left their side. I don't want to be a Kufin. That Kufa, not today's Kufa, that Kufa. Where I'm calling the Imam, the Imam comes and I'm not ready to give up. Why? Because there's a, there's a social norm that I am doing today that is against the deen of Islam. The Imam is coming to remove that social norm and I'm not ready to change, change my behavior. So my last point as a thought for all of you before Salat is very simple. To me as well. It's very simple. Ask yourself, I'll ask myself, my behavior today with myself, with my God, with my spouse, my kids, my community. Is there a social norm that I am following today? in my behavior, my young guys on social media, et cetera, et cetera, that is accepted today, but won't be accepted by the Imam. That it's just accepted, okay, it's given, everyone does it, sab I know what's the big deal? You Maldives come and change everything, what's the big deal? Let this one slide at least. Then when the Imam comes and says, Asa, can you drop this behavior? And you think very easy, I'll just say, okay, Imam, go ahead, I'll drop it. It's ingrained inside of me. That behavior is entrenched inside of me. How do I remove that? These things happen before the Imam comes, not when the Imam comes. But then it might be too late. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ya Allah accept our qaleel ibad in this month, inshaAllah. <coughs> we ask you, Allah, to forgive our sins, the sins of our parents, our marhumin, on this night of Thursday, inshaAllah, this night of Friday. We ask you, Allah, to give us that tawfiq to understand what our responsibility is during the ghibat of the Imam with the hopes that when the Imam comes, insha'Allah, we will stand beside him and support his cause. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.